Hey everyone, welcome to the Option Series live stream uh, brought to you by ESS. Uh, I'm Andrew Klinkman, I'm one of the curators of the series. We have a really wonderful program for you tonight uh, with Hannah DeBacker, who is streaming in live from uh, Antwerp, uh, Belgium at, what is it, two in the morning where you are right now. Sorry for keeping you up so late, uh, but thanks for joining us. Um, we're gonna view some videos of your performances uh, tonight and discuss your work a little bit. Uh, and before we get into the first, uh, I believe it's a solo piece, yeah? Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to see if there was any context you wanted to give us about this first piece here or any kind of introduction to it uh, from your perspective before we dive right in. Um, yeah, I'm sure the, it, it can be handy to have some context uh... Uh, not specifically about the music I'm playing, but more like the place and the time when I was doing it. Uh, because I last month I, I worked on a special project that was like in my mind for some years. And uh, more by accident I was able to, uh, to uh, make it happen this year. And uh, I walked the whole Belgian coast side with three musicians. Wow. Uh, to make a regi registration of the Belgian coast side. Um, because some years ago I thought like, yeah, there was like some article in the news, like in 60 years, Belgian coast will not be like, now it's 100 kilometers from where I live, but mm -hmm. the coast will be just like here in front right. of my street. Wow. Um, so I thought like, maybe it's time to document it, like how it is now, and then I can show it to my grandchildren later. Um, so... That's what we did like one month ago. And um, the solo pieces uh, in the video, they're like uh, recorded on the fifth day. So, <laughs> and it's recorded in a church, a very wow. special uh, uh, church, not that I'm so uh, religious, uh, or I, I am religious, but not Catholic. Let's uh, say it like that. Um, but it's like a, a, a very special priest who owns a church and uh, it's in a town close to the harbor. And it's also not that far from Calais where there's like big refugee camps. And mm -hmm. this is a kind of a guy who really helps out everybody who comes knocking on the door. And he gets like bullets in his uh, mailbox from right wing protesters. And it's, <sighs> it's really ugly. Uh, yeah. But he's a really fun guy, and I asked him, like, hey, we're walking the whole Belgian coast side. I'm looking for places where we can also record indoors. And he was like, yeah, come, uh, no problem. So um, what you will see is recorded in that church uh, on the fifth day after walking already, like, 15 kilometers with uh, my baritone saxophone on my back. Wow. Uh, so well, that's it. Fantastic. Well, yeah. without any further ado, let's dive right into this first solo piece from Hannah DeBacker. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, welcome back. Thank you, Hanna, for just providing these wonderful pieces for us to uh, enjoy. Uh, I really thought that first piece was so beautifully shot. It was really uh, amazing to just enjoy the kind of space that you're playing in there and appreciate the kind of sonic components of that. And also, I just thought it was shot very beautifully, and it was cool to see those super macro close-ups of you playing. Um, I wanted to start our discussion tonight, just maybe talking a little bit about your entry into music and performance, if you have any uh, early musical memories you want to relay to us, or just kind of how you sort of more formally got into uh, playing the berry, um, or if you could just uh, share with us uh, a little bit about that first. Um, yeah, about... Uh... Really early memory is funny because like I was uh, watching the video myself this week and uh, I was like, actually, how did I en uh, ended up in a church playing? Uh, and then I realized like actually when I was really young, like I think five or six, I sang in a, in a church choir and mm -hmm. I completely forgot about it. But I think that's like my first musical uh, experience. Like wow. in a way I didn't like to do it or didn't like to go to it, to the rehearsals, but I remember like uh, the singing part itself, I really enjoyed and it was fun. Fantastic. Um, and um, also uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about it with friends. Like I also remember my mother always singing in choirs, like this long classical concerts 
of hours and like mm-hmm. we had we had to go and watch it like late <laughs> in the evening and it was like there were no uh, smartphones or, or iPads those days to keep your children quiet so you were just like a kid sitting there and you had to find a way to get through these two or three hours of classical music absolutely uh, and i i of course i wanted to listen to pop or rock or something else so it was like this exercise in um, imagination or creating imagination on music and it's only nowadays that i realized that it must have had some impact or a big impact uh, but i never thought about it until a couple of weeks ago actually that wow. I, we really went to a lot of concerts <laughs> absolutely uh, um, and and how did you arrive at the baritone as your kind of uh, central mode of uh, performance, or at least your main instrument, musically speaking? Um, uh, I started alto, of course, like mm. when, when I was 10 years old or something. And um, I finished high school and I didn't know what to do. And after a couple of stories, I ended up at university. And then from university, I actually went to a theater school. And when I entered the theater school, I... Um, I remember that's that's when I moved to Antwerp, um, and in the first year I met this uh, drummer that I knew from uh, I don't know anymore from where, but I asked him like, hey, I, I would like to play saxophone again because I I quit because of all the studying, um, and he was like, yeah, but uh, you should go to Ben Sluis here in Antwerp, and I don't know if you know him, but Ben Sluis is like a really uh, known alto player in Belgium, uh, really a remarkable artist. And actually, he was like my first jazz album that I borrowed from the library wow. when I was 14 years old. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, and I can take lessons with him for not that much money. So that's how I took up the alto again. And then after three years lessons with Ben, he said like, yeah, you have this good amateur level, but if you would work harder, like... You could get more out of the saxophone and that for me was like it was still on the alto but it was like a really turning point for me Mm -hmm. because um i always loved to play the instrument but i never had thought i was capable of becoming a musician in a way um and and from the day he said that i just i started practicing like a maniac and uh, i tried to get into conservatory even after theater school Mm-hmm. Uh, and that didn't re- that didn't work out on the alto. And then I was like fed up with the alto, didn't play for a while, started giving acting lessons. And in the school where I was teaching, there was this giant case in uh, in the teacher room. Mm-hmm. And like one day, I was like, "Hey, what's in the what's in the case?" And it was a baritone, wow. and I could borrow it for like forty euros for a year. So I, was, I just took it and I started playing baritone. <laughs> It's <laughs> not a bad deal. It's a good yeah. bargain. Yeah. And um, I think I think why I went to the baritone was because for me I'm quite tall and I was always like jealous uh, of guitar players in the bands where I was playing with and the baritone was really like like the guitar for me like it felt like ah this is like the motorbike I was looking for. <laughs> uh, like both like the sound and the the physicality of the instrument. I hear you. Um so you mentioned your your background in theater as well, or, or your your formal training in theater. Um, do you see your theater background and your music performance as like completely discrete, separate parts of you, or do you think that there's like a a large intersection between those uh, creative pursuits for you? Do they connect to each other at all? Um, I think uh, more and more they do, and especially from when I start playing more improvised, free improvised music, um, I think that's like when the connection really started to come. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because for me, it's it's a very emotional way of playing, or at least I'm more capable uh, in this period of my life to put more emotion in the free stuff. Um, And with the project I did this year, I'm, I'm like, um, 
I have a big uh, love for performance art, more than theater. And I think with the project I did uh, one month ago, like these two really came together. Mm-hmm. And I, I was super happy about it. Like, oh, wow, it's possible. I can do this. Like, fuck yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, as someone who came through like a very academic musical training background myself, there's so much uh, that you don't get taught coming up as a musician because you're just taught to learn how do you how to play your instrument and learn to play this repertoire or that repertoire. And there's almost no like formal way of talking about the performance aspect of, of, of what we do. Right. Uh, and it wasn't until, I mean, for me, it wasn't until playing in rock bands or doing other kinds of like modes of musical performance where I realized like, Oh, there's like this whole other thing here besides just looking at my instrument and playing notes and making sure I'm playing the music good. But there's like a whole thing of like having a personality and having something to express like emotionally or otherwise to the audience. Um, so it's really interesting to hear you talk about that background and how that is kind of coming back around for you and connecting uh, again with your free playing. That's really fascinating. Uh, also, by the way, for folks in the in the chat tonight, if you have any questions for Hannah, feel free to throw them in the chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can uh, before the end of the night. Um, but maybe. Right now is a good time to jump right back into the second solo piece uh, here. So uh, let's check that out. Uh, once again, Hannah DeBacker, um, just wonderful to hear you tonight and, and chat with you. So let's check out wonderful the Wonderful to hear you, Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, welcome back to the Option Series live stream chat with Hannah Thabacher uh, in from Antwerp. Uh, we had a question in the chat from Jeff Guy asking, how did your improv or real-time composition aesthetic develop? If you could describe that process. Um, it's about the first piece, I guess, that he asked. Um, I already forgot the question. Can you? Can you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, if you could just describe uh, your approach to kind of real-time composition as you're improvising uh, in these solo pieces in particular. Uh, I remember when I when I start. Um, also for the second piece, the goal um, for these solos was to really stick to an idea. Because it's something I, I um, I'm working on for me myself. Like when I listen back to uh, registrations, I often at the moment I thought like, oh, this is taking long enough. I switch to an idea, uh, and and then you hear it afterwards. It's like uh, it could have been much longer. It would be much stronger. And even when I uh, hear them now, I think like it should still have like longer it's like it's still too short and um so with the first idea just like technically speaking it was like okay i go circular i have a kind of pulse that's not fixed but it's it's like there is a certain tempo under it and i i just don't uh, stop uh, the harmonic development uh, where the harmony really goes to um i don't know actually <laughs> like this is something in the moment. Um, some parts I really hear on the saxophone. Some are also by accident. I think it's it's yeah uh, it's it's quite a conscious and not conscious process. I think. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I think especially with solo playing, uh, how you kind of are able to process thoughts and how you're able to experience time are two like enormous. <laughs> Uh, often terrifying things, at least speaking for me personally, you know, being able to go into a solo piece, oops, phone dropping, uh, go into a solo piece and, and, and even experience time and know how much time is elapsing, you know, as you're doing it, and also mm -hmm. how to kind of condition your mind to process those ideas and know which ones are, you know, the right decisions to make and which ones you just got to ignore and, and move through the pieces like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always, you know, such an immense struggle, and yet that's, you know, where the, the really good stuff comes from. Um, but it was really wonderful to hear those solo pieces. I really love yeah, them. Yeah, the, the funny thing is, like, with the second one, actually, uh, when I had to send, uh, I, when I had to uh, choose what I wanted to uh, show tonight, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, actually, I, I'm not uh, happy with the second one, because I remember, like, I was so hard, I took the idea, and I was like, shit it's like <laughs> this is gonna be a, a really struggle and 
I, I still can hear myself struggling, like, because I was, for me, that one, the second one, it was like, I will not, like, uh, end up in, like, this multiphonic playing, which which I can easy, like, do, like, I can just choose for the multiphonics and go ahead, but it's, I know where it leads to, um, and and I I want to, nowadays, I'm really challenging myself to you have the extended techniques that evolved like very much last couple of years, but like with the second piece, I, I didn't want to end up in any of the real extended techniques. So I stayed between Carter tone, multiphonic, and then I started to slap, but I think like, no, no, I, want, I don't want to start to slap. So, but in a way it's, uh, I think it's a, for me, it, it was a interesting video to watch. Like I would uh, title it struggle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, also, yeah, the, the idea of putting restraints on yourself and sort of forcing yourself to focus on a limited amount of material, because I think uh, it's just a, a really interesting approach to it, because I know, you know, with solo playing, it's so easy to get overwhelmed with the possibilities of the directions you can go in and the techniques that you can bring out in a given piece mm -hmm. that it's almost so much more helpful. A lot of times you should be like, no, I'm not using any of that. I'm going straight forward. I'm, you know, I'm going to force myself to really just deal with this limited set of material and see what I can kind of pull out of there. And I think you did a really wonderful job with that piece and it was you know, very Thanks. enjoyable to see. Uh, we have a question from Tim Daisy uh, asking uh, if Hannah could talk about the venues in Antwerp and in Brussels uh, pre-pandemic that catered to improvised music uh, and anywhere else in Belgium that has like a, you know, a lively scene for this music. Uh, if you could just describe that uh, for us. Um. Yeah, well, let's start with Antwerp uh, because I live here and for me it's also where it started. Um, I think uh, uh, most obvious uh, uh, organization here is Sound Emotion. You know Kuhn and Crystal? Mm -hmm. so it's, it's shout uh, out to Kuhn and Crystal. Yeah, <laughs> big shout out. So yeah. it's uh, a couple, I think uh, most free jazz musicians in uh, Chicago will know them. <laughs> Um, it's where I, uh, it's Kuhn and Crystal that made me uh, uh, see uh, Dave Rampis for the first time a couple of years ago. Uh, it's Kuhn and Crystal who uh, let me uh, meet you guys uh, and play with Ken Vandermark two years ago. And it started, uh, they organize a lot of uh, concerts. And um, what they also do, like they give opportunity to uh, more beginning musicians that are interested in improvised music and they support in a way that they uh, invite you to play with people you haven't played with and they don't do it like one one time but they they really are supporting me in that kind of way now for three years or something like i i really owe them a lot because i i was able to play with so many people uh, in belgium and out of belgium and um so it's it's a really nice uh, they don't have a place but they have also good contacts with uh, existing venues in Antwerp so they they organize but they do it on different places mm -hmm. so uh, I think they they are really a huge uh, uh, power in the scene of Belgium um, in Ghent you have like a similar kind of organization, it's El Negocito Records. Uh, it's it's more like one guy with his team, it's called, it's called Roger. And like, for instance, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I saw, for me it was a mind-blowing concert watching John Dykeman, Hamid Drake and uh, William Parker. Wow. Um, so that they have like more or less, the programmation is a bit different, but they have really also a big part, very much in common, music-wise. Um, and then in Brussels, there's there's more smaller organizations, and both of them also organize stuff in Brussels, especially Kuhn and Crystal. Um, and they work together, like you have the big venue, it's called Ancien Belgique, and it's like, it's like where, uh, I don't know, um, name a big band they would mm -hmm. play in the ab but they have like this very small room upstairs <laughs> and there's also like improvised uh, concerts over there um and actually there are many musicians in uh, in brussels so um it's 
it's like this triangle, especially when you live in Fla- Flanders. Like it doesn't really matter where you are. Like it's between Brussels, Antwerp, and Ghent. Mm-hmm. And then uh, in the French-speaking part, the southern part of Belgium, you have like uh, Point Culture in Charleroi. Uh, you have also a young collective with Farida Amadou and Thomas Mondier, like guys from Liège, uh, mm-hmm. organizing stuff. But the whole scene, like. Uh, that's my experience like after some time everybody it's a sm- it's a really small country so everybody yeah. knows everybody and and it's also for me what's the difference with like more um traditional jazz um that's it's really uh, over the language border so for for me it's, it's quite uh, normal to play with french speaking uh, musicians and that's that's like the first time I, I experienced it when I started playing improvised music. Uh. Fantastic. Yeah, I love uh, just talking about Kuhn and Crystal for a moment, just to gas them up a little bit. Um, talk <laughs> about the, the way that they really, you know, treat the music community as, you know, just a, a fluid thing that they can bring new people in and not, you know, be gatekeeping on the level of, you know, who has what experience and who doesn't, but really just throwing people into new experiences and and seeing what possibilities come out of that is such a huge, uh, you know, critical service to humanity the way that I see it, because Mm -hmm. you're really like doing so much work to create so much more uh, work and new work and new possibilities. It's just really amazing that they do that. And uh, I, I wish that every city had a Kuhn and Crystal that could throw people into new, you know, situations and see what comes out of it. It's a really beautiful process. Yeah, um, I think also the most important thing is that they do it like on a long term. Yeah. Because that really gives, for me, it gave me the opportunity to really evolve like on a much faster tempo. Yeah, Absolutely. It's a very important thing. And I think a lot of other organizations uh, forget about it. They take like... Uh, a young hype and they just support it for one year then it's next one but this is like really long term yeah especially uh, yeah when there's so much these days around someone's notoriety or popularity and and getting names together with other names to perform but really mm-hmm. doing the work of of you know letting people find themselves in the music and find what they really enjoy and what they like to create and uh you know it's just fantastic um, also speaking of venues, uh, I was, I was preparing for this talk and I was finding some videos of you playing and I found your, your duo, uh, with Mark, you have some records with, and there's mm-hmm. one video It appeared, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was in maybe some old sewers in Antwerp. Is that correct? Or it said the oh, drain yeah, yeah. of Antwerp. Yeah. Um, yeah. it really kind of got my mind going because then I was thinking, well, you know, a sewer is kind of like a giant saxophone in a way, right? Because what is a woodwind <laughs> instrument but like, you know, piping and, and different, you know, uh, uh, directing air or whatever in different directions um, and also creating those acoustic possibilities. And I just wanted to ask you about uh, your relationship with physical space and, and how that uh, affects the way that you perform, both from an acoustic standpoint and also... You know, we were talking about the performance aspect as someone with a background in theater. Like, how does the space that you're in uh, impact the way that you perform? Obviously, in the the project that we're seeing a lot of tonight, you are in this church uh, along the coast of Belgium, or I can't wait to see the trio music that we have coming up. But in all these different spaces along the coast, and it seems like that's something that you kind of take into account very seriously kind of the space around you and how you can interact with it. Uh, mm-hmm. If you could speak about that a little bit. Um, I think it comes from uh, before I started studying like a maniac on a saxophone. I, mm-hmm. uh, I was working like a maniac with a theater collective. Uh, we were like four nerds reading books and wanting to make performances about it. Mm-hmm. And we, we always did it outside. Like in, in a, one summer, we, we worked a whole summer in a field um, in between uh, railroads of Antwerp, uh, mm-hmm. like in this industrial old uh, scene, um, and we could like make theater there. Like once in two weeks, we made a show, 
and it was based on literature, but it was like full with uh, strange people coming and um, uh, costumes and musicians playing. So we were inviting people over and it was, uh, um, I think there it came from, like I, I enjoyed this um, uh, having to deal with the location rather than a black box where you control and you have to make something out of it. Like it already inspires or it's already like uh, a person, I, uh, an, an acting um, antagonist or I don't collaborator, know. Collaborator, yeah. A Absolutely. collaborator. So you have to, um, yeah, you have to deal with it and Absolutely. you don't control it. And especially when you, when you go outside, like you have the weather. Yeah. If it starts to rain, it's raining and it, it changes and you, it will change what you wanted to do and you have to accept it. So for me, it's quite close to playing improvised music because you have to, I, I, I prefer to play along with others. I'm, I'm not this much into soloing, mm -hmm. uh, but this is what I like so much. Like it's about accepting and dealing with it instantly and don't stop, but just try to make it work. Uh, Absolutely. Even when when you're getting soaked and and uh, lightning and thunder is going, um, so I, I enjoyed this working outside very much for that reason and also um, uh, yeah like like uh, inspiration um, and of course music wise um, yeah it's just nice to have lots of reverb on your saxophone. I don't like to put it in a in Ableton on my saxophone, I will never right. do it. But when it's there, I, it's so nice it's to, the best. Uh, to it's... scream through your saxophone and hear it 10 seconds later still there hanging. <laughs> it's Absolutely. like Absolutely. masturbation on the saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even as a guitar player, I think when I can be in a room where I can turn the amp up really, really loud and hear it come back to me again, it's always a fun feeling. Um, and how has that transformed for you now in the past year you know, not being able to really be in the same room as other human beings as much and not be able to perform inside. I know you mentioned a lot, uh, you know, really enjoying playing outdoors as well. Uh, how have you adapted um, over the past year really being limited in the amount of or the, the variety of spaces that you're able to perform in? Well, regarding to the, the project that we did, um, there was like this evolution because the first album of Gabro was in this reverb space, nice. Um, and then the second one, I worked in the prison of Antwerp. Mm -hmm. So I think there I already took a step like what I a bit was lacking in making music and what I really liked making theater was like, um, um, not not in a political way, but um, to, um, um, I don't know the word in English, but to, to look at society and to interact with society mm -hmm. in a way. Um, and I also, when I studied saxophone um, in Belgium and in Finland, this was what I was really lacking in the education. Like it was just like playing the bebop. And and then I went to a museum and I was like, hey, but this, this like artists are making their work based on what they are looking at uh, around them. So mm -hmm. this is what I was more or less trying to do although i think it's a dangerous zone like you don't it can also be very tricky and uh sentimental and i do, i really want to stay away from that uh but so i started working in a prison and and see like i was into Pauline oliveros uh, deep listening method mm -hmm. and in this performance art is some deutsching shay and like this was really like one year a big trip for me Wow. And, and I started also doing like meditation and I really, I, I really started realizing the impact of sound on our bodies and believing like we can really kill somebody with sound and we can cure somebody with sound. And I discovered Milford Graves and like this all came together. And um, for the last project, um, I don't think the music, yeah, we, we weren't able to play for people, of course. Uh, but in a way, because of the whole walking thing, mm -hmm. it, looked, it looked a bit special, of course. And uh, I think 
in a way, like I can't expect everybody in um, at the Belgian coast side to be interested in uh, free improvised music. Uh, a lot of people that I know or, or my friends really don't get what I'm trying to do. They're like, "What the fuck?" Mm-hmm. Uh, but with this project, like we reached a lot of more people, and and I. For me, it's an important thing I, I start to realize. Do not stay on your island. And and uh, I don't know yet what the, what what I where what the direction is that I'm going. But I I must admit that I really enjoyed to to try it. <laughs> Fantastic, absolutely. Um, so before we we get into this final trio piece tonight, could you talk about the trio a little bit and maybe preface uh, this last video uh, for us? Um, well, you will see Andreas Brawl, uh, a piano player who's not playing the piano. Um, uh, it's uh, a good friend. He lives quite close. As soon as we were allowed, we played. We started playing together during lockdown. So okay. he's quite uh, my uh, music buddy uh, for a couple of years now. Um, and then you see Raffer Tesse on drums. Um, he's also Belgian, but actually he lives in New York. But uh, like I, th- I think six or seven months ago, I got an email from Raf. We never met. We saw each other on Facebook doing stuff. But he wrote me like, yeah, I'm in Belgium and uh, I'm stuck here. Um, do you want to play together? And we played a couple of times together. And I was still, I was working on the project. And I, I was like lacking the third person. And then I invited Andreas and Raf for some sessions. And it was like, yeah. It's super clear, like, I have to go with these two guys. They're crazy enough to do it. And uh, and it was so nice playing together. And um, I'm still very happy that I asked those two uh, for the road. Yeah. Amazing. Well, uh, we'll get you to bed soon. I know it's getting pretty late in Antwerp. <laughs> Actually, I'm but, waking up again, yeah. But uh, I appreciate you uh, joining us tonight and sharing your wonderful music with us. Um, so yeah, just wanted to... just sure how much I appreciate your presence here tonight. Um, So let's get into that third piece uh, and uh, everyone have a wonderful evening.
Thank mm-hmm. you. 